what is mimetic desire? What is, what is that? Hmm. Mimetic desire means that a person's desire for an object is not determined by that object itself uh, independently, but fundamentally determined by a third party or a third person that mediates the desire for that object. So we normally think of the desire between a person and the object of their desire as, as a straight line mm. uh, from them to the object, right? Like we want the shoes, um, we want the artwork, or we want the person uh, due to the qualities that are in the, are in the thing itself. And don't admit necessarily that our desires are heavily influenced, maybe even primarily influenced for the vast majority of things that we want by third parties, third, mm -hmm. like a, a third person, often mm -hmm. hidden, often somebody or something that we're, or a group that we're not aware of that mediates our desire for that object. And that's called a, a, a mediator or model of desire in Girard's language. And we'll talk about Girard later. But this idea that desire is not as independent and autonomous as we think it is. Mm -hmm. And I think most of us have this idea of our desires as being entirely our own. You know, this is probably a, a product of the Enlightenment or just some kind of highly individualistic idea we have, right, about, you know, what it means to be... I, I probably Americans have this idea more than more than some other cultures, right? It's just it, it's it's I'm the soul. I sort of like create my own reality, even my own desires. Like I'm right. the manufacturer of my own desires. But if you just stop for a second and think about that, I mean, it's obviously not true. I mean, going mm -hmm. back to when I was born and sort of the things that I wanted being mediated to me by my parents. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I didn't choose them, and having deeply embedded desires before I even knew that that's what was happening. And, you know, as we go through life, we adopt usually unconsciously other models of desire that help color or flavor why we want some of the things that we want. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't claim that all of our desires are purely mimetic and that we're, you know, these sort of mimetic puppets that run around wanting things because other people tell us to. I think that we can be. I mean, mm -hmm. that's sort of the danger. It's part of why I wrote my book, because the more we are aware of it, I think the more we can have self-possession, the more we can intentionally choose who our models are and things like that. But mimetic desire is, is fundamentally a desire that is mediated by others. And the word mimetic itself just means to imitate. Mm. It comes from the Greek word mimistai, which means to imitate. So it's okay. imitative desire. Mm. But the reason it's not referred to in mimetic theory as imitative desire, the reason we say mimetic desire is to imply something that is uh, a bit more hidden mm. and subconscious and typically leads to conflict if we're not aware of it. Whereas mm. imitation has a bit more of a neutral connotation, at least, gotcha. than, than, than mimetic. So mimetic desire is this kind of desire that... Uh, we're guided by through the various models and, and mediators that all of us have in our life to varying degrees and uh, and identifying sort of how that force works uh, was really, I mean, a life-changing moment for me uh, and the time between my sort of understanding how mimetic desire worked in my life and the time that I wrote the book was about 10 years. Uh, and I sort of had to write the book, I think, to understand it as well as I wanted to. Yeah. I hear that that's always the... I mentioned him earlier, but James Clear, writing Atomic Habits, he said, you know, you write the book you need, basically. And, and, uh, and it sounds like you, you went through that too. But yeah, how did you, like, what was that experience like of, I mean, maybe first hearing the term and then that 10-ish 10, 10 year period of like maybe fully understanding or grasping it, like what, what was the turning point? What happened? Yeah, James Clear is good company, man. I, I think... Um, you know, it's funny, like I probably spent 10 years trying to explain what mimetic desire was to my friends after I'd had a couple glasses of wine and failed miserably for like 10 years. And then finally <laughs> gotcha. I was like, I need to, I need to write the book. Need to write um, the book. Yeah. Uh, it's, I need to spend two years and uh, about 80,000 words. Right. I, I first heard the, the term um, back in 2000, um, I mean, it's been more than 10 years, um, back in 2009 or 2010, mm. around the time when I 
had sort of taken a mini sabbatical from one of my companies and sort of delved into reading uh, and had a friend who was um, a Girardian at the time and, and recommended that I look into some of these things. And then I kept, I mean, I kept hearing the, the name from different people and in different places. I went on a retreat um, and... Uh, the name sort of, Rene Girard. R Rene Girard. Okay. Yeah, R Rene Girard, who is the... Um, you know, who, who, who this all comes from, right. um, his, he's, he's the originator of this theory. And, it, you know, it took me hearing the name five, six, seven times before I actually, you know, realized that this is something that I should look into, especially once I heard people that knew me well say, you know, you, this would really resonate with you. I think this would explain a lot of the things that you've been grappling with for a long time. And that led me down a, a real journey of just understanding myself differently, first of all, as an entrepreneur. I think that I even started a company or two for highly mimetic reasons. You know, I, I have this belief that oftentimes entrepreneurs talk about, you know, starting companies to solve problems in the world. Mm. But a lot of times we start companies to solve problems in ourselves. Right. And uh, a company can be a very uh, expensive way to, to do that. You're probably better off going to therapy or something. <laughs> right. so, yeah. You know, that, that was the case for, for one of my companies, for sure. You know, as I was miserable, stuck in an in investment banking uh, analyst job and, and, and right. left and, you know, gr grappled with my own mimetic desire for a while. I mean, the first thing that I did was see it in everybody else except myself. And then I saw it in myself. Mm -hmm. Geez, I guess it was about five years ago that I, I had went to a conference that they have every year with scholars of mimetic theory. There's, there's one, um, usually there's, they alternate between the U.S. and Europe. So mm -hmm. I went to one in Denver. I went to another one in Innsbruck, Austria, and sort of tried to see, you know, what are people talking about in the space of, of mimetic theory? Mm -hmm. And I realized that it was, I mean, there's brilliant people that go to these conferences and they all present white papers. It's, it's a very sort of academic conference. And there wasn't a lot of application to everyday life mm. or to things that I could relate to. And I realized that there's a real need to sort of bring some of these ideas or even just the, the concept of a medic desire, I think, would be extremely valuable for creators to understand anybody in business, especially entrepreneurs. Mm. And I sort of you know, asked around and I, I realized that no, I was the only sort of person like me that attended this, this conference. Everybody else was an academic. And I came to the, the frightening realization that if there was going to sort of be someone that, that might attempt to, you know, write something to bring this to a larger audience, that it might have to be me. Mm. And I sort of denied that reality for a long time. And then I finally decided, you know, let, let me just go for it. You know, it's like a lot of creative projects that's just sort of like, you know, burn, burn a hole in you and, and, and just, you know, you, you can't, mm -hmm. you can't not do the thing right until you give birth to it. Right. It just right. drive you crazy. And the book eventually got to that point for me. Mm. Uh, and that set me down a, a long, journey of, of, you know, publishing something with a traditional publisher, which is not something I, I thought I'd ever do, which is a whole nother story in itself. But I, I learned a lot, not unlike starting a company in some ways. And, and I think I learned more about mimetic desire, including my own in the process of writing that book than I did in the nine years, uh, 10, 10 years prior to that. 